morning and welcome to uh, another week of uh, This Week in Environmental Justice, another installment. It is Thursday, August 18th. Uh, I'm Tim Cromarty. I'm here with Tamara Raspberry Harris. Good morning. Welcome, How are morning. you? Very good. Enjoying the uh, the late summer heat. Not. Oh, and what, what heat it has been, right? Yeah. And um, it's, it's kind of a good segue into what we're talking about today with the legislative updates, because I'm really concerned that with what we've been experiencing with extreme heat, extreme fires, that, you know, some of these bills didn't move forward. Like maybe yeah. politics got in the way. Yeah. Um, politics yeah. is money. <laughs> right. Right. It's some very sound policy. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. So what do you what do you got for me? What 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 stayed? What left? What? Is moving on. What's dead on arrival? Before we get into the bills, we have a public service announcement uh, that came in from the California Public Utilities Commission, uh, an organization you have a lot of familiarity with. Lots, yes. Um, they are asking consumers to hold off on doing their laundry between the hours of four and six p.m. This is a uh, power outage prevention prevention measure because we did have a power outage at least here in Sacramento about two three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, happened on a Saturday night, just wrecked my Sunday because I was, you know, the dog got nervous. I was disrupted because uh, I was not asleep at midnight when it hit. Um, and they ask that people also consider hanging out their clothes to dry as opposed to running their electric dryers. So uh, they're pushing this out to consumers via text message and they uh, post a, uh, a, a URL on their website. Okay. To go to for further updates, uh, the EJL, we put that out on Twitter yesterday, I believe. So folks, uh, just check our Twitter page if you want to know the, uh, the, uh, the energy upgrade uh, tips on how to pre help prevent a power outage and what, you know, you can actually, um, consumers can earn money if they can uh, save an uh, appreciable amount of energy. So, right. So a little background, when I worked for the utilities, that that's called a flex alert, right? So yes. flex alert, um, where they're asking um, customers to reduce their energy usage because um, the alternate is, well, we're going to have to shut down some grids so that we don't shut down the entire grid system. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Now it's 108 degrees outside, no. right? So um, it's so the t the industry term is time of use, T-O-U. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, very technical because remember, they remember a long time ago, like when you and I were youngsters, they said, wait until four o'clock to do your electricity. Right. Right. Wait, just wait until four. And mm -hmm. it was this issue of. Um, the, the whole campaign was, I forgot what it was, but Tim Conway was, you know, one of the, the pitchmen for the, for the campaign. And it was about, you know, don't turn your lights on until five, you know, right. don't wash dishes, don't do your laundry, wait until five. The and comedian Tim kid, Conway? Yes, yes, yes. I that. <laughs> From the Carol wow. Burnett show. Yeah. And so, uh, for for decades, that was always the thing. Like electricity was cheaper after five. So, right. but as the grid integrated uh, renewable sources, uh, you know, wind and solar onto the grid, those run during the day, right? Solar and wind only run during the day, and and usually between nine and five is when they run. So the most power available is between nine and five. Now, the studies, you know, we did all kinds of studies to show when do people use the most energy? What's the time of use? And the biggest time of use is between five and seven o'clock mm -hmm. where families and people are coming home from work and everyone right. flips everything off, exactly. flips everything on, oh, TV, right. cable, to wash, blah, blah, blah. but at that same time, the wind and solar are going off grid. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, a high a spike in use with an extreme drop almost at the exact moment of available electric uh, electricity resources. Not good. Right. And so when I was at the utility, this was like, what, 10 years ago, 
we knew we had to do a campaign to change the decades of thinking of use electricity after five, wait till five, wait till five. Remember, I always say black Mm -hmm. blacks have always been green. Right. My dad was like, you better not turn on a single light until five o'clock. It's costing me money. Right. It's costing me money. Electricity is cheaper after five. Mm -hmm. But now but we so we've had to be we haven't probably people haven't realized it, but there's been a campaign for the last like five years of reversing the message and saying, oh, okay, like use your electricity during the day and reduce your usage at night. Yeah, I'm so surprised the, they cut it off at six because to me it was like the peak hours in the announcements I've seen in the past are four to seven, not six. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But but also, in especially in, Sac, in the Sacramento area, that's the hottest time of the day, yeah. right? When that sends all the way west. That's the hottest time of the day. So if everyone's flipping everything on fans, air conditioning at the same time that those available resources are dropping, then, you know, crisis ensues. Absolutely. So just a little history behind that. Okay, very good. So on with that, on to our legislative update. We have uh, about eight bills to update. Most of the bills that we've been tracking and supporting surprisingly are still standing so we you know normally Yay. there's quite an attrition rate this year <laughs> this year it's, it's we're betting you know almost a thousand good job um, Tim. ab uh two it was just dumb luck ab 267 by a assembly member of Valladares is the secret exemption extension uh we're supporting that it would extend the secret exemption for specific fire reduction projects on federal lands so facilitating thinia forests and other fuel reduction activities to reduce the likelihood and severity of wildfires. That's been a big Mm -hmm. deal uh, in this region since 2016. It seems like the major, two or three major wildfires every summer. Right. Uh, It's not quite as bad this year, knock on wood. Uh, That bill is on Senate third reading, so it is almost all the way to the governor's desk. Okay. uh, Still moving. The next bill is Assembly Bill 1857 by Christina Garcia. Uh, That is a solid waste bill, uh, which is really long overdue. It repeals a provision in law giving right. municipalities credits, uh, well, local governments in general, but mostly municipalities credits, recycling credits uh, for burning or the incineration of solid waste. That is a mm-hmm. statute originally enacted in 1989. Uh, since that time, we have a major recycling industry that has uh, grown up. We have had um, become aware of and witnessed problems with global warming, concerns about that. So between the fact that we've got a robust recycling infrastructure now and the fact that uh, burning solid waste is doing horrible things in terms of generating uh, CO2 and, and increasing greenhouse gases. Uh, there's no reason to give anyone a recycling credit for burning solid waste anymore. So basically, just removing that from the books. That bill uh, is also on Senate third reading, so it too is almost all the way to the governor's desk. Mm-hmm. Uh, third is Assembly Bill 1897 by Assemblymember Wicks. This is non vehicular air pollution control and would impose civil penalties of up to $30,000 for refineries that release toxic air contaminants under specified circumstances and impose them penalties of up to $100,000 for a second violation within a 12 month period. Now that one uh, has made it uh, to Senate third reading. Uh, That bill is also uh, important because if you grew up anywhere near a refinery, uh, in, in a black or brown, predominantly black and brown area, you had releases into the atmosphere. I grew right. up in Richmond, Chevron right. refinery. Right there, there. Was famous for periodic problems in the 70s and 80s. In 1988, right. they had a major fire and wound up having to pay all the residents uh, a certain uh, uh, settlement uh, for damages resulting from ash and other fallout from that fire. Right. So that's a good one. Yeah. Is the asthma that you have now was do you think as a result from the environment you grew up in which in Richmond? No. As no. as bad as it was, you know, if you're living by the bay, which we were within a mile or two of the bay, the the you know, the wind from the bay is cleaning right. the air constantly. So right. no, my asthma is a result of moving to Sacramento 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I had no problems until I came to the city. So yeah. Blame it on Sacramento and the tree. <laughs> We're in a big bowl here. Things don't move. Right. <laughs> uh, so the next bill is, thank you for asking. The next bill is Senate Bill 260 
by Senators Weiner and Stern. That is the Climate Corporate Accountability Act. Mm-hmm. That bill is on the assembly third reading, so it's almost all the way through the process as well. We're going to require all American uh, U.S.-based corporations with annual gross revenues of $1 billion or more that conduct business in California to publicly disclose their greenhouse gas emissions inventory each year. That is kind of a, a, a public humiliation slash shame tactic. The shame. If they yeah. are violators because of the fact that, you know, we are uh, way behind on reaching AB 617 goals. And one of the thoughts is it's because the corporate number one, the law doesn't really have any teeth. There's no real penalties for non-compliance. And these corporations, some of them are simply not making good faith efforts to get those emissions down. Let's get a report and see where we are, is the, uh, the thought behind this bill. Um, next is um, a bill by Senator Hueso, SB 733. That had to do with um, gas corporations and renewable gas and uh, procurement. It would have required uh, the PUC to consider establishing procurement goals for renewable hydrogen as defined for gas utilities and transporters. That part of the bill is fine. Um, the, it, we had an opposed position on this one, and the, the right. reason was that it also required the PUC to evaluate whether to authorize a gas corporation to recover expenses from infrastructure built to deliver biomethane, renewable hydrogen, or both from a producer to the pipeline as part of its base rate. In other words, you're making the necessary investments that you would need to make anyway to expand into natural gas. We're going to tell the PUC whether to authorize you to pass that cost onto consumers. And our thought was, why should the necessary investments in renewable gas be subsidized on the backs of the ratepayers? Right. So uh, that bill fortunately stalled in appropriations. So uh, we're not sorry to see that one go. Right. I, I can just imagine from all the words you said exactly the entities that were behind that bill. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you a lot, can of, imagine. lot of clues in that. I won't say who, but right, uh, right. yeah, the investment, uh, the using rate payer funds, which are the customers, you know, the money that the utilities collect from customers to invest in infrastructure rather than the shareholder funds is like a whole market game. Right. But the PUC has frowned upon um, utilities going to rate payers for piggyback as a, as a piggyback, piggy right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we're not sorry to see that one get stalled. Right. <laughs> um, next is a bill by Senator Skinner that we're supporting SB 1075 that had to do right. with clean hydrogen. Yeah, we talked uh, to her about that. This is a progressive measure that would create a clean hydrogen hub fund to support state bids for federal hydrogen hub grants and positioning California to compete for and potentially bring in millions in federal funds to promote the development of hydrogen fuel and the accompanying infrastructure. So to the degree that we're trying to promote green hydrogen as an alternative fuel, this is a very progressive measure. It would require the California Air Resources Board and the Public Utility Commission, uh, as well as the California Energy Commission to incorporate hydrogen into their decarbonization strategies, including requiring the Energy Commission to develop a definition for renewable hydrogen and get that in state statute. Apparently we don't have one right now. That bill is on assembly third reading. So it too is a Senate bill, it's all the way through the Senate. Uh, It's uh, on its way by all indications to the governor's desk, heavily supported by the Enviros as well as uh, ourselves, Mm -hmm. since we're part of that community. Um, Next is a bill that refers to a comment you made at the beginning of the podcast having to do with, you know, this continued heat wave and measures state is trying to take to alleviate that and and what's happening with them. Uh, Assembly Bill 276 by uh, Assemblymember Luz Rivas, Extreme Heat and Community Resilience Program. That bill was held in Senate Appropriations. Okay. Unfortunately, it would have created a new program, um, the Community Resilience Program, appointed a chief heat officer and a new extreme heat hospitalization and death reporting system to mm. track the the uh, the worst case scenario health impacts of, of heat and coordinate state efforts to support local and regional plans to mitigate those public health risks uh, pertaining to excessive heat. 
Uh, that was a good progressive bill. It was right. probably stalled because it was launching a brand new ambitious program. I'm sure there were a lot of costs associated with it. If any of the um, affected agencies, such as the uh, Department of Public Health or the Governor's Office of Planning and Research or others, if any of them would have been affected in terms of workload, I'm sure they uh, put a very unfriendly fiscal tag on it. And that's probably helped us would get installed in appropriations. It may have been, I'm not sure, but it may have been opposed by Department of Finance, uh, which is also uh, can be a death knell when you're in the appropriations. Committee. Right. But that so was a, the concept was really good and progressive. Right. I was saying, so the state doesn't have a official count of how many deaths per year due to extreme heat. But when Europe had their extreme heat wave, right, they were immediately able to report countrywide how many deaths were affected by by the heat. Yeah, we have and nothing like that. We have nothing like that. And that's really unfortunate because obviously those who suffer the most in, in a heat wave are unhoused, right? Mm. Um, and the elderly um, mm. and, the, and the, the poor elderly who are, right. they're not able to regulate their own body temperature and may not live in an area where they have access to air conditioning. Or they can't afford to run it. Or they can't uh, afford the to run it. They would have to pay. Right. Yeah. I know my grandmother, you know, lived to be almost 100. And she was always cold. She always had a sweater on. I don't care how hot it was outside. Oh, yeah. She had a sweater on. She that was happens when you cold. get older. Right. Yeah. And so as you get older, it's harder to regulate your body temperature and know that, you know, it's really hot outside. And it's cold. And that's why the elderly suffer. Um it's more dangerous for them in, in heat than, um, and of course the unhoused. So that's, that's unfortunate that the state doesn't have a, the data, cause I'm sure the data would show that this is a problem Oh yeah, and like Definitely. where the problem is in the state. <clears throat> yeah. I think um, the local governments may, to the degree they've got the resources and the, right. and they may collect that data. The state doesn't. And I, I to my knowledge, the, the federal government doesn't do it either. Right. So, um, that's unfortunate. Hopefully that bill will come back again in the future in some form. Yeah, let's hope so. Uh, next is AB 2797 by Assembly Member Petrie Norris of the Decarbonizing Fuels Incentive. Um, in a nutshell, that bill would have established a carbon neutrality fund and required, subject to appropriation by the legislature, uh, the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration to make specific uh, incentive payments uh, to a transportation fuels vendor based on the carbon intensity of the fuel sold. So it was an attempt to uh, promote uh, carbon neutrality with incentive payments if you are producing cleaner fuels, in a nutshell. That bill, unfortunately, was held in Assembly Appropriations back on May 19th. The Environmental Justice League joined an effort of spearheaded by the Clean Air Coalition to uh, have it become, instead of budget request, for $500 million mm -hmm. to establish that carbon neutrality fund. Got some traction with it up to a point, but as of last week, um, the Clean Air Coalition met with uh, the powers that be in the legislature, and the signals are it simply is not going to happen this year. Okay. okay. Uh, the governor's request to maintain the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant for a year or two longer, it was due to be shut down uh, later this year, are... Uh, our, was a major factor because there's money going for that. That's a higher priority. The governor's uh, desire is to continue that power plant in operation long enough for us to get more grid capacity so that once it goes offline, uh, we've got the um, surplus power right. in the form of additional power plants to make up, make up the difference. We're not right. there yet. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of nervousness about shutting down Diablo under those circumstances. The administration's working on that um, to the degree that the governor has uh, ambitions to run for president in 2024. You can't do that very effectively if the lights are out in your state. Right. We saw what <laughs> happened to, to Gray Davis. Right. Uh, so that's in, <laughs> in part that's part of what's going on. But in, in, in another aspect, he's being a responsible steward of the public interest. Look, I'm not comfortable taking this nuclear power plant offline. If you're telling me, California Energy Commission and others, that you we don't have the grid capacity to make up the difference once that source goes offline. Right. So uh, double edged sword there. Uh, 
the the uh, the other issues the factors were that there are obviously competing climate change proposals uh, vying for a piece of the action in terms of whatever comes out through the budget uh, at the end of session. Other member requests from last year that were left over that weren't dealt with last year that are in line ahead of it. And uh, so with all that going on, it's not going to happen this year. But uh, hopefully we will we'll see it come back uh, next year. The, the folks that are pushing it, Clean Air Coalition, have been encouraged to uh, to keep at it in the future. So and that is it for our legislative update. We will, uh, that bill, uh, so that, that one's gone. The others, uh, uh, most of the others are still supporting. So we will be sending um, requests for signature letters to the governor's office on the, the bills that are still standing. Mm -hmm. Because every indication is, you know, these environmental bills that have gone all the way through both houses, essentially. Right. There's, unless lightning strikes, they're going to the governor's desk. Right. In a state like California, with uh, an environmental uh, lobby as strong as it is here, right? So, what 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 are your thoughts of the governor signing these? Because I know some environmental groups haven't been too happy with the governor lately because of some inactions that they felt he sh that should have been that he's you know not taking or delaying. Right. Um, and of course, factoring in what we see as he hasn't announced it, but those of us who see the writings on the wall see that he's positioning himself to be available to run right. for higher office <laughs> if the opportunity presents itself. So yeah. but it, it, would the environmental bills be a, a hanging point? Because that's really strange coming from, you know, a Democratic governor in a state like California. Yeah, he's not been as, you know, I'm sure he doesn't have a 100 percent, you know, report card from <laughs> Sierra Club and others, but he's he's trying to balance competing interests. Uh, the two the things that occur to me are one. Uh, are there any downside to supporting the bills that are headed to his desk? Signing them, and two, um, obviously he's got an incentive to keep the environment as happy as possible, given that he wants their support in 2024. He certainly doesn't right. want them uh, slinging mud at him or opposing his candidacy or you know, making problems. So um, for some of these, that they're a slam dunk. The the uh, AB 267, the Sequoia exemption, that's about wildfire uh, prevention, preventing either preventing wildfires altogether or right. uh, curbing their severity. That's right. a slam dunk. There's no right. downside to supporting that. Same thing with AB 1857, which simply repeals a, a law that should have been struck years ago, authorizing local governments to get a credit for burning recycling. There's no way he's not going to sign that. Right. Um, you get into some of these others that um, talk about imposing penalties on refineries and polluters right. and others. Then it gets it becomes a much more political analysis you know, who do I tick off and what are the consequences going to be? So AB 1897 by Wicks, which would impose civil penalties of from 30 to $100,000 on refineries? Maybe not. We'll see. We'll have to wait. See. That one's a wobbler, in my yeah. opinion. That'll be a wobbler. Um, same for SB 260, which would require all U.S.-based corporations with the annual revenues of a billion or more to publicly release their greenhouse gas emissions. That's not a, 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 a penalizing measure per se, but it does uh, perhaps force them, these corporations to release information they'd rather not have out there. It's probably outside their comfort zone. Uh, so that too, you know, there will be some interesting political analysis beyond what happens with that. Uh, green hydrogen, <clears throat> I think there's no downside on that. That's Skinner's uh, bill right. SB 1075. There's no downside on that. That's positioning California to compete for more federal money to promote green hydrogen. No downside whatsoever. Uh, and the remaining bill, uh, the other things are off the table this year, AB 276, the extreme heat. That'll be a problem for next year. Same with the budget request on the decarbonizing fuels, et cetera. Right. So, uh, 
We'll see. We got a couple of uh, slam dunks and a couple of wobblers. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I can already see like the commercial, uh, you know, his for the presidential campaign. And he's saying, I did. <laughs> oh, yeah. I stopped. The for the environment. Burning trash. I'm for took, the environment. Took strong measures to reduce the severity of wildfire. Right. I you increased know. the Find uh, corporate buildings. polluters or not. <laughs> Yeah, I found corporate polluters and I shamed right. them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can so, see that. Well, well, you get you get you get in election season, you start to get a little um, skittish right. about certain measures. Right. I've seen it happen before. Right. Yeah, we've seen several things where it's like, wait, that just happened. But I right. say elections make strange bedfellows. Oh, yeah. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you have very high, high, high ambitions. Exactly. Um, we get it. Plus with term limits, you know, you have what has evolved is a situation where most electeds, certainly on the Democratic side, are reluctant to antagonize a particular donor base or multiple donor bases because of the fact that term limits exist. And I am either perpetually up for reelection or I've got to figure out how to position myself to run for higher office because this this is not going to last forever. Right. So at some point I'm going to want to go for statewide office, uh, state constitutional office or or higher federal. federal. Mm-hmm. And I may not be able to do that if I have antagonized, you know, the tech companies or the oil companies. or the. Right. Or, so it's a very um, interesting calculus that goes on. Right. Uh, it doesn't always lead to profiles and courage. Right. <laughs> How the sausage is made, right? Exactly. How the sausage is made. So, uh, well, you're ready for, for a that. new Tokyo okay. moment. <laughs> so, what, so what's the rest of the legislative schedule? So it's kind of a debt. August kind of starts the green light for the uh, downhill speed racing to the end of session. <clears throat> right. So that goes through. What's the last day of session? I believe it's. Um, I should know this. I believe we got, we got like 12, 13 days. I believe it's August 31st. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is because this is the end of the biennium. Yeah, um, so this is the early end. Yeah, and so, yeah. once that happens, there will be what uh, there's a certain time period the governor will have to sign bills. So then the clock will start ticking. 30 days. On so the measures. 30 days from the end of session. Right. The clock will start ticking on these measures that have made it to his desk in terms of what happens with them and how long he has to take action. There's a handful of bills that um, each year, sometimes they just don't sign and they automatically become law and they have not been vetoed by the end of that deadline. Yes. So some of these bills we've discussed might, might fall into that category. We'll see. Really? So it's plausible deniability. Right. I just, you know, law, didn't get to I, it. I didn't want to sign it, but I didn't want to veto it. sign it. So, right. yeah, then, you know, we'll see. Maybe yeah. um, maybe you can, as a candidate for president, maybe you can get away with that. Uh, personally, I doubt it because I think everyone knows, um, you know, failing, failing to sign or veto is simply failing to make a decision to take responsibility. It doesn't change the outcome. Right. And you and you as governor know full well what the outcome will be right. uh, based on what you do or do not do. Right. Right. Yeah. Like I said, this time of the year, it's always a strange, strange dance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very definitely. Well, good luck up there under the dome, getting everything to the uh, end of session. It's been quite a exciting year um, up there in Sacramento. We're holding it down for you in the Bay Area. Very good. Yes. You continue to do so. Need your support. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. A lot, of, a lot of good things. Besides the cool down, there's a great um, festival that supports um, Blacks in green space. And so we're looking forward to that. What and festival is that? It's something new. It's called the uh, Soul, the Green Soul Fest in San Francisco. Oh, really? The music festivals um, supported by the um, the Baykeepers and mm-hmm. um, some local cultural groups. Um, so that should be interesting. And also there's announcement that if you are have a library card, you can go to your local library 
and use your library card to check out a pass, a parking pass to go to state parks for free. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, mm. you know, some state parks, you know, the entrance fee, you know, could be $9, some are 20 So that's, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. 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 So encourage people to go to your library, get a free parking pass. Glad I have a library card for a local jurisdiction down there. <laughs> right. So do I. So we want to encourage Black folks to get out there, get your library card, get your free pass. And, you know, let's not only support our libraries, but support our state parks and, yeah. and, and enjoy the resource that that is available to everyone. And if you have overdue books, you might want to get those back. Yeah. Quickly and quietly, <laughs> surreptitiously. <Right. laughs> you know, you sneak into the library and leave them on a leave them on a table somewhere yeah, and like, slink ooh. out. I always think of the George away with that now. What's that? They, uh, I don't know if you can get away with that anymore because they have those electronic things where you know you walk through the thing and they it, the, the barcode and the book trips it off. So who knows? Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah. Maybe yeah. get away with that. There, Maybe the after was, hours a book drop is a better idea. Yeah, the book drop. Right? <laughs> in here can I have a yeah. parking pass come back the next day oh yeah. see yeah some libraries had lift, had made a moratorium on overdue library fees because they just you know wanted people yeah. to come back so they were like you like don't worry about paying your over your your late fees just come right. in and and drop your books off and come get a new one come come back to the library yeah, I might so. have one or two myself I gotta go oh no go look to that pile <laughs> Yeah, we want to su- we want to support our public services like libraries and yeah. state parks. Very good. Well, it was good talking to you today. All right, Thank another you. good update from from our man in Sacramento. Oh, Thank glad you. to do it. We yeah. have uh, we got a couple of weeks left in the session, and uh, hopefully we will have uh, good news on what happens when the dust clears. Right. Right. <sighs> We will see. So we'll talk about what gets to the governor's desk and then what bills he signed. That would be a, a great episode to do a Monday morning quarterbacking of uh, why did he sign this and why, yeah. why did he sign with, that. With coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for your time. This has been great. Uh, this has been uh, This Week in Environmental Justice. I'm Tim Cromartie and Tamara Raspberry Harris. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right.